Hello. Hello and welcome to the closing keynote. My name is Paulus Schoutsen. I hope you have enjoyed all the amazing talks. I definitely enjoyed them. If you missed the talk, or if you had like wanted to watch two talks at the same time and had to pick one, don't worry. We'll make sure that we're going to upload all the talks to YouTube in the coming weeks. I hope that you still have a little bit of attention left for the closing keynote, because we're going to have some exciting announcement that will shape the future of Home Assistant. And just to get cut right to the chase, the first thing I would like to talk about is versioning. And to help me talk about that, I would like to invite Frank to the stage. Hey, Frank. Hey, how are you doing? Frank has been in charge of the Home Assistant releases in the last year, and he has done a phenomenal job. Whoa, he has become you. a de facto expert when it comes to Home Assistant versioning. So let's take a look at the Home Assistant versions and how it all started. So Home Assistant started with version 0 0.7. And yeah. you know, I did was like, I decided like, I picked the first version to be 0 0.7 because you know, already pretty stable, we're pretty mature. We only have to add a few new features and then it's going to be good. This was six years ago. And we're on 118 today. Yes. And so the next release, a lot of people are expecting this to be 190. Yeah, I no. maybe, may, no, yeah, maybe not. Actually, no. No, we decided no. to change it up. That's not that. So what do you think, Paul? There it is. The mighty 1.0, we finally did it. Well, we finally did it. Oh, hold, hold it right there, Paulus. Hold it. This oh, is, wait. no, this is not, this is, we're going, no. No, actually, we're going to do something different. Oh, are we like just going to chop off the zero and then just go to 119? So it's like a continuous numbering? This has been suggested by a lot of people, right? Like right, this, yeah. this makes total sense. Like we just solved the problem. Just, yeah, it seems like zero. it could work. But, Actually, no. It's something different, even. Oh, wow. It's going really big. Yeah. We're going even higher. <laughs> oh. Can you guess what's coming? Yeah, you can guess. Like, you know, but of course. <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's bad acting, right? So here we are. <laughs> that is awesome. 2012. Home Assistant 2012. Here we are. And uh, I'm uh, going to explain you guys why and what's going on here. Okay. So, I'll log off. I'll see you, see you later, later, Paulus. So here I am. Can I get my slide on? Yeah, here we are. So the main question is, where is 1.0, right? And I guess the main reason for not having 1.0 at this point is because of what is displayed on the screen right now. With the tremendous power and flexibility of Home Assistant, any addition, improvement, or even tiny bug fix is most likely somebody else's breaking change. And we have been adding a lot of changes to the release notes lately. Like we, we mentioned every breaking change, covering every tiny change as well, like fixing a typo in a unit of measurement. But yet we always run into things that were breaking for people's use cases that we never thought of. So we have been running for the 1.0 milestone for a long time already. Goals have been stretched and adjusted quite a bit because, for example, our user base grew and changed. But also the world of IoT around us is rapidly changing as well, right? So did we ever made it to 1.0? I guess we have made it. I believe so. But what does 1.0 mean in the end, right? And various people have different ideas on that. Semantic versioning, for example, is a well-known set of rules that is often used. However, people rarely end up agreeing on what changes should go in which version. And let's be honest here, it's a number. It's just a number. So instead, we have chosen a new and different path, which I will talk to you about in a moment. First, let's talk about a beta of this release. If you have seen the rumors, it has been carrying the 1.0.0 uh, release marker. So why was that? 
It's an homage. It's an homage to the 1.0 milestone that everybody has worked hard on the past years. I think we made it. 1.0 is here, even though for just a moment and only for this beta. And that's something we should celebrate. Thanks everybody involved on making that milestone happen and congratulations to you all. So we are going with an easy versioning scheme that is human, recognizable and intuitive. Calendar versioning, also known as Calfer. The Home Assistant Core version number will be based on a year and month, plus a patch number to indicate bug fix releases. The version number makes it easier to determine the age of the release you are running at your home. And today we are releasing Home Assistant Core 2020.12.0. This will also mean we are going to have a new release cycle. Instead of the three week cycle we have right now, we are going to change into a monthly cycle that matches this versioning strategy. A major new release of Home Assistant Core is planned every first Wednesday of the month. This is easier to remember than the previous three-week cycle that actually required a calendar, a calendar to keep track of. The beta is going to be unchanged. The beta week will take place the week before each release. The release in the new year will be Home Assistant Core 2021.1.0 which will be released on the first Wednesday of January, which is January the 6th of 2021. All right, that's all I had to tell. Enjoy Home Assistant Core 2012, or sorry, 2020.12.0, I actually spoke there, which will be available today. Hi, my name is Stefan and I work mainly on the Home Assistant operating system. Today we are proud to announce the first stable version of Home Assistant operating system release 5. So what's new in release 5? Release 5 comes with improved discovery features. So far we had multicast DNS which allows using homeassistant.local in URLs to find a fresh installation of Home Assistant. But it doesn't work reliably in all environments. LLMNR doesn't need the .local suffix and works particularly well in Windows and modern Linux environments. We improved reliability of the core system service to start Home Assistant Supervisor. Corrupted containers or similar issues get detected more reliably and the system recovers automatically from it. We also improved the external data disk feature. Pascal mentioned it in the opening keynotes. It allows to run the operating system from the SD card and store the data on, the data on an external data disk such as a USB attached SSD drive. Moving data from the internal storage to the external data disk is now much faster. Finally, we updated our build system build route. This brings new versions of all software packages part of the OS image, such as systemd246 or version 3.0 of our security framework AppArmor. For the Raspberry Pis, we now moved to the Linux kernel 5.4, just like the latest release of Raspberry Pi OS. We also updated U-Boot 2020.10. With this, we can, we can support Raspberry Pi 4 with 8 gigs of memory, as well as the Compute Module 4. We did quite some testing with the 64-bit version and do recommend 64-bit image for Raspberry Pi 4 from release 5 onwards. There is now Odroid C4 support, a very cost-effective alternative to the Raspberry Pi 4 in a similar form factor. We also added Asus Tinkerboard S support 
a variant of the Tinkerboard with the fast onboard EMMC storage. As usual in the past weeks, we made the several development builds using the release version 5. But today we release version 5.8, which is the first stable version of the release 5. It is based on Buildroot 2020.11. We will continue doing maintenance releases with security fixes, bug fixes, as well as small improvements as needed. For the future, we are aiming for two major releases a year aligned with the build root releases in February and August. So for release 6, we are aiming for March 2021, and it will be based on build root 2102. Our main goal for the operating system is reliability. We want it to be boring, essentially. We will keep using techniques used in reliable embedded systems, such as full disk image, we fall back. The root file system will stay read-only. For those reasons, Home Assistant OS is not your everyday Linux distribution. And it will stay that way. There is no apt, there is no package manager. It's a single-purpose Linux distribution meant to power Home Assistant. We are going to improve x86 support. We plan to add a generic 64-bit x86 image, which will work on all kinds of PCs. This one image will also be suited for virtualized environments and brings more drivers which will make device pass-through functionality working in most situations. Lastly, we plan to add issue reporting also on operating system level. This will allow us to get detailed reports from crashes and other abnormal events happening in actual installations driving our homes and hopefully lead to faster bug fixes. No worries, privacy first. This will be opt-in only. Being busy with OS work, I don't have much time to improve my own home automation lately. I still have this throttle-free remote, which isn't doing anything. I've heard Bram has some exciting news to make that much easier to integrate than it used to be. I can't wait to try that out. Over to you, Bram. Yes, thank you, Stefan. Let's talk about automations. That's what home automation is all about anyway, right? So I'm doing a live demo today, so let's hope everything works. Um, I have a IKEA remote here, same as Stefan. So I should be able to help you out, Stefan. And this is meant to control a light, and that's exactly what we're going to do today. We're going to control this light over here. I hooked up the remote and the light to Home Assistant already. So the light is this table light over here. And if I toggle it, you see that the light toggles. But my remote doesn't do anything yet. So if I want to control my light with this remote in Home Assistant, I have to map every button of this remote to an action of the light. And when Home Assistant started, we didn't have a UI to create automations yet, and everything was done in YAML. So an automation would look like this. We had technical users back then, and they were willing to dive into technical stuff to make it work. As you see, we have a trigger here, and it's listed for an event, and it needs a lot of event data. And there's where it gets really technical. You have to go to the de developer tools. You have to listen to the events. You have to translate all the information you get from the event and create a trigger out of it. It's not easy. So luckily, we got a UI to create automations. We got things like device triggers and device actions. So now I can just select the device I want to use for my trigger the remote, and I can select the trigger, the turn on button is pressed. And we can do the same for the action. I can select the device, table lamp, and I can tell it to toggle. Okay, great. We created one automation for one button, four buttons left. 
The UI and device automations attracted a different type of user, a user that was less technical, but that's the same wish to automate their home. This means we now have two user groups, one that lives in the UI and one that lives in YAML. They use different tools, but they want to get to the same result, yet they can't share their work right now. The UI uses devices and device IDs, and they're not easy to remember or find. And the other group works mostly with entities. So as we've seen in the talk for Frank about automations, they use different syntaxes. But it would be so cool if people could just share their automations. Most of us use the same automations, and yet we have to build them all from scratch, taking a lot of time and a steep learning curve to build them. Wouldn't it be cool if you could just share your hard work with the rest of the community and to be inspired by the work of others? Today, we introduce a new feature of which we think can solve these issues. It's called Blueprints, and I'm going to show you how we can create this automation easily with Blueprints. So first of all, we have to go to the configuration panel. And there we find this new section called Blueprints. Let's go into there. And we see two Blueprints here, but no Blueprint that can help us with this remote. So let's discover some more Blueprints. We click on the button here. And we have a new section in our community forums. It's called Blueprint Exchange. And it's specifically designed for sharing your Blueprints. Um, this was a beta feature. So our beta users have been playing around with this. So we have a few blueprints already. And here I see uh, IKEA five button remote for lights. That sounds perfect. Yes, that's the remote we want to use. Thank you, Frank, for this blueprint. And as you can see, it is YAML. It's pretty advanced, but it doesn't have to be this advanced. OK, now let's use it. How does it work? So to import a Blueprint in Home Assistant, we have to copy the URL of the form topic. Then we go back to the configuration panel for a Blueprint. We press Import Blueprint. Here we can enter a URL. This can be a URL of a GitHub Blueprint or a community form like we just copied. So let's paste in the URL and click Preview Blueprint. This takes longer than normal, but hopefully it still works. Yes, there it is. We get a description of the blueprint. Control the lights with an IKEA five button remote. That sounds like what we want. OK, so we press Import Blueprint. And now we got a new row here with the blueprint. So let's create an automation with this blueprint. We click Create Automation. And here we have the blueprint. We got a description here, and then we have to pick a remote. Of course, this automation needs to know what devices to use for this automation. So a blueprint can specify what inputs it supports. So in this case, this blueprint specified it needed a device. So the UI shows a device picker, but it also specified it needs a specific device, an IKEA device with a specific model number. So this blueprint can show in the UI only devices that will actually work with this blueprint. So if I open this device picker, I only get one device back, as that's the only one that will work with this blueprint. OK, that's great. Now to the lights. As we've seen before, some people use entities, some use devices, and some use areas. And in Home Assistant, we didn't really have something that worked with all these things. So we added it. It's called a target. And a target can contain areas, devices, and or entities. For this specific blueprint, it specified the entities had to be of the light domain, of course. So when I pick an area, I only get to see areas that contain lights. So let's pick my bedroom. And now I have the area here. But actually, I don't want to automate all the devices in my area. 
as an area is very, very convenient as when I add a device to my area, I don't have to update my automation as that device will automatically be targeted by the automation. I only want to automate this light. So when I press the arrows here, I can expand this area into the devices it contains. And then I can simply delete the device I don't want. OK, now we have the remote we want to use, the light we want to use. Let's save it. And now it should work. So if we click the remote, it turns off. When we click it again, it turns on. And when we dim it down, it actually dims down. That's great. Live demo worked. So as we've seen, blueprints are written in YAML. And any automation can be turned into a blueprint and be made reusable. You can create a blueprint that can be used in multiple automations to be used in multiple rooms, for example. But it really shines for shareabilities. Automations we can all use. So as we've seen, Home Assistant ships with two default blueprints. One blueprint that will act on motion devices to turn on your lights. And one that will tell you when a person leaves the zone, it will send an automation to your mobile app. But there is so much more possible. Think of notifying you when the dryer is done. Pause a media play when you get an incoming call. Get a notification when the batteries of a device run low. The possibilities are endless. You can all create blueprints for it, and everyone can just use it. And while browsing the blueprints of others, you might get ideas you never thought of before. Today, we launched the first version of Blueprints, and we have a ton of extra features in mind that we still want to add to Blueprints. But I think with the current version, we already changed the way we will do automations in Home Assistant. That's it for Blueprints. If you want to know more about Blueprints, about creating them, and how it all works, check out the documentation that will be online later today. It includes a really nice tutorial on creating Blueprints. I will now pass you on to Paulus, who also has some excited news for you. Happy automating. All right, blueprints are amazing. It makes it possible for us to take all the home automation expertise that lives inside our community and make it available to everybody. Imagine being able to take one of Thomas Lovens automations and just make it work for your home without, without, by just configuring all the entities. This is gonna be so good. And it also allows our advanced users to automate their homes more efficiently than ever before. But I'm not here to talk about blueprints. Because I'm here to talk about something else, hardware. This is the Odroid N2 Plus. It is a board that has been added as a supported device uh, to our operating system in the last year. It is a little bit more expensive than a Raspberry Pi 4. It comes with a heatsink and has a real-time clock on board powered by a battery. It is slightly faster than a Raspberry Pi. The single, CPU, uh, co single core CPU benchmarks come in at 20%, multi-core CPU benchmarks come in at 60, and the memory bandwidth is around twice as fast. But the kicker is the Odroid N2 Plus is so much faster than a Raspberry Pi because the input output blows it away. See, the Odroid N2 Plus is 22 times faster doing input and output. It is actually, uh, an input and output means it's reading and writing data to a disk. It means your logbook will fly. It means your history will be so fast in Home Assistant. Restarting Home Assistant, doing updates, all these things are super fast. And to be fair, this is, this is actually not really a fair fight because a Raspberry Pi still uses SD cards, and those are slow, while the Odroid N2 Plus uses eMMC flash storage, and that's just really, really fast. Another thing that is really great about the Odroid N2 Plus is that from the bootloader and up, everything is open source. And that means when something is broken, we can go in and fix it. Over the last year, we have worked with well-respected Linux kernel uh, consultancy firm Bay Libre 
to find and squash bugs inside the Odor N2 Plus to make it sure it works perfectly with the latest Linux versions. We've also made sure that the fixes we found were being upstream back to Linux so that anyone with an Odor N2 Plus, even if you don't use Home Assistant, can use all these bug fixes. The N2 Plus really, really is a great device to run Home Assistant. I even would go so as much as saying that right now, it is the best way to run Home Assistant if you take into account speed, price, and reliability. It actually has more power than Home Assistant today needs, which means that it's future-proof. It can easily run hundreds of integrations and thousands of automations. But there's one thing about the Odor N2 Plus that I really, really don't like. It just doesn't look that good. Like if you look at it, if you first hear how great it runs Home Assistant, and then it comes in this look, that doesn't match up. It needs to look better. So we asked ourselves, can we do better? Can we make a great case for the Odroid M2 Plus? And the answer was no, we can't. But we were able to team up with somebody that could. So together with Rick Haan, we designed a beautiful Home Assistant case. It comes in any color that you like, as long as you're able to 3D print it. This case consists out of three printed parts that form together an amazing case. The top part, contains a beautiful uh, Home Assistant logo engraved into the, to uh, into the roof. We're going to publish these models today for free. This way, anyone will be able to print their own case and have an N2 Plus that is stylish, reliable, and private. OK, actually, there's still a problem. Not many people have a 3D printer. In fact, 3D printers are so niche Many people don't know anyone with a 3D printer. And plastic is great, but it doesn't give that premium feel that running Home Assistant on an N2 Plus deserves. So we have done something that we have never done before. We left our comfort zone of making software, and we decided to get this case manufactured. And this was a lot of fun, because we have learned so many new things. It was also super, super frustrating from times, because, well, it was all new to us. Timing-wise, during this during the pandemic, also not ideal. So before I go into more detail, let me start with a photo of the case, which we call Home Assistant Blue. The Home Assistant Blue case is made of, out of aluminium, out of three separate parts. The top part is made with aluminium extrusion and anodized in blue. The front and back parts are cut out by a CNC machine from a solid piece of aluminium and chrome plated. Let me take it, uh, I, I've got one here. This case is really, really beautiful. Wherever it's in the house, it will not go unnoticed. For the design of the Home Assistant Blue case, we have been inspired by kitchen appliances from the 70s that have bright colors and have shiny metal. And depending on where you're gonna put it in your house, you can actually turn the top part around to either align the logo with the port or align the logo with the front of the case. This has been our first foray into making something. It's been a learning experiment, and that's why we've created only a limited run of these cases. To distribute and sell these cases to our community, we've teamed up with HeartKernel, the creator of the Odroid N2 Plus. Together with HeartKernel, we're going to sell the Home Assistant Blue bundle. When you buy the Home Assistant Blue bundle, you're going to get a limited edition Home Assistant Blue case. It will include an Odroid N2 Plus with four gigabytes of memory. This is the fastest and available N2 Plus. You're gonna get 128 gigabytes of eMMC storage, which is the largest size amount eMMC storage available for the Odroid N2 Plus. And it will have Home Assistant pre-installed. It will also include a power adapter for your region and the case and all its parts will be pre-assembled. And because the N2 Plus is an officially supported device for Home Assistant, we will make sure that it's going to be able to run the latest version of Home Assistant for years to come. We have been making Home Assistant easier for a couple of years now. Easier to onboard, easier to configure integrations, to set up Lovelace dashboards, and to automate your home. And Home Assistant Blue bundle comes with Home Assistant pre-installed. This is not a special version of Home Assistant, no, this is the exact same version you can download from our website when you download the Odroid N2 Plus image. And this means 
that if you want to get started, when you, the Home Assistant Blue Bundle arrives in your house, you plug in the Ethernet cable to connect it to the internet. You plug in the power cable to connect it to the power. And after that, you can use our mobile companion apps to onboard or use a browser or your computer. You will be up and running in 10 minutes. The Home Assistant Blue Bundle will be sold directly by Heart Kernel for $140. It will also be available with via various resellers in the United States and Europe. These resellers will handle shipping and import duties from Korea, so you can get the bundle fast and worry-free. To buy a Home Assistant Blue Bundle, you can visit our Home Assistant website and start your 2021 in style. Thank you.